And when the church is resurrected, the dead in Christ rise first, according to Paul. Dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive and remain are changed in the twinkling of an eye. We're caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And it says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We never leave his presence from that point on. So after that first resurrection, there's only one more resurrection. And that is when the dead are delivered in Revelation chapter 20, and they're delivered to the great white throne judgment. At that point, everybody is brought to life. Death and hell, scripture says, death and hell are delivered up. And they are then ultimately cast into the lake of fire. Remember, we talked about how death and hell are buildings, like a house. They're, they're domiciles. They're places where people can stay. They have dimensionality to them. And Jesus takes the house called death. He throws it in the lake of fire. He takes the, the house called hell. He throws it into the lake of fire. Now, everybody is in front of God to be judged. And we know from the book of Matthew chapter 25, that there is a separation that happens with sheep and goats. And the sheep go on the right hand, and the goats go on the left hand, and everybody on the left hand goes to judgment, everybody on the right hand goes into the glory of the Father. And in Revelation 20, we see that that's based on the person's name being written in the book of life. And whosoever's name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I'm just tying some of these pieces together. <clears throat> so what we have on earth right now, <clears throat> potentially... A handful of people, maybe a number of people, I shouldn't say handful, maybe there could be thousands, of people who might have been saved and are glad that they learned at the very last minute when they saw Jesus come back that he really was real and they believed, right? That can include a number of Jews who finally believe in Jesus as Messiah, right? Uh, you have the people who hate him that never wanted him to rule over them in the first place. You have the people who have the mark of the beast who hate him and are going to hell and they know that, well, strike that everyone, they're going to the lake of fire, and they know they're going to the lake of fire because now all of a sudden it makes sense and they realize he really is who he says he is and now I'm down. There's nothing I can do about it. And they're telling their kids, don't be an idiot and don't do what I did because I'm going to burn forever. You at least have a chance. Right? That's the population of individuals. And the world is so fully decimated by this point that there are dead lying all over the grounds. So much so that God has to send fires across the face of the earth to purge the earth to cleanse it. Because there's no, cap there's no possibility of burying all the dead. We even see at this time when Jesus comes, Revelation 19, that that great slaughter that happens is that feast. We talked about how wedding feast, God is preparing a wedding feast. And then later on in the same chapter, we see the word feast being used to represent the kings and the warriors and all of those that were murdered, killed by God, who were trying to kill him. Jesus defends himself, he defends his city, all those people die, and we know from that that the blood goes to the bridles of the horses for 200 miles. And, we, and, I, and with a little calculation we did, making a 200 mile cattle trough, 5 feet tall, filled with blood, 9.5 pints per individual on average, came out to something around 235, or 235 million people in that specific experience, and that if you count the blood that was overflowing, out of that 200 miles, it could be as much as 420 million people that died in that one thing. So 240 to 420 million, someplace in there, were included in that experience. And scripture says that Jesus treads the winepress of God's wrath, which leads us to believe that he's the one that cleaned house, and he's the one that took care of that 240 million count. That's a lot of people. So that's the world he's coming back to. That's the world that the church is coming back to. And for those that died during the beast kingdom who will be ruling and reigning with Jesus, that's the world they're going to be ruling when they help him. And I'm just going to say I hope I get to. I really do. What a great opportunity to stretch your leadership skills. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, to have a thousand years where you get to try to actually show the love of God and to, lead, to have that time to be able to lead people to salvation during that time, right? I mean... There's going to be people over that thousand years that want to know the Lord. There's going to be people that resent the heck out of Him. We know that they do because by the time we get to Gog and Magog here in just a minute, you've got the population of the world once again trying to destroy Jesus. People, what do you do with them, right? Okay, so let's. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through all of Revelation 22, and we're going to go back, and we're going to hit Old Testament scriptures, and we're just going to pile through some Old Testament, which is just you're going to love. Here we go. 
And he, the angel, chapter 22, verse 1, <clears throat> showed me a pure river of water, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So by this point, we see God showing up here. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which had twelve manner of fruits that yielded a fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Why would there need to be healing of the nations if there was if everybody was resurrected? Right? This has to happen before the resurrection, before the final judgment, right? There have to be humans involved for healing, because if everybody was already in the resurrected body and the judgment, final judgment had happened, there wouldn't be any sickness. <laughs> The leaves are for the healings of the nation. So let me give you kind of a story. We'll read about this in a little bit in Zechariah. <clears throat> we'll read about this in just a little bit in Zechariah. The, every year, the kings of the earth will come to Jerusalem. And they all re, they're required to bring their offering every year at the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't come, according to Zechariah 14, they're judged. Their land receives no rain. If they refuse to come the second year, their eye sockets rot away in their head, their tongue rots away in their mouth, and their flesh rots off their bones. And somebody else takes the kingship. And now somebody else has to leave that country. So you don't get two chances. The second time you don't do it, you're judged. <clears throat> That's a rod of iron. So there is still sickness going on in the earth at this point. And so if you're a king and you're honoring God, you're able to come in if you're allowed, and you're going to have to, to be able to get into the gates of the New Jerusalem, you're going to have to be a Christian. You can't get in if you're not, because only those that have the name written in the Lamb's Book of Life are able to enter in the New Jerusalem. So you're a person, you're ruling a people, you're a follower of Jesus, you're allowed to walk into the New Jerusalem because your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. While you're there, you can grab leaves from the Tree of Life, and you can take it back for the healing of your people. Kind of cool, I think. The tree is kind of cool because it says that it bears 12 manners of fruit and it yields its fruit every month. Now, I don't think that that means that it's one fruit per month. I think it means that it bears 12 different types of fruit and it bears it each month. Because if you remember, this is a Hebrew book. The Bible is for Jews. It's not for pagan Gentiles, right? We are grafted in, but it wasn't like <clears throat> this. You don't see, uh, and I saw the holy city, the new New York, coming down from God out of heaven. No. It's the new Jerusalem. This is the revelation of Jesus. This is an Israel experience. This is a Jewish experience, a Jewish book, a Jewish account, Jewish history, Jewish prophecy. We get the privilege of being part of it because we've been grafted into the vine. But this is about Jesus and the Jews. This is the revelation of Jesus to the earth, primarily starting with the house of Israel. And if you remember, <clears throat> the Jewish calendar, sometimes it has 12 months and sometimes it has 13. So for us to interpret this and say, well, it must be one fruit per month, means that we're thinking of the Gregorian calendar that always has 12 months. Right? Jewish calendar doesn't. And it doesn't say some months it has 12 kinds of fruit and other months it has 13 kinds of fruit. It just says it has 12 kinds of fruit. So now it's always possible that one of those types of fruit grows twice like two months when there's the month of Aviv, right? And, that, and it happens to grow, maybe the same fruit grows twice, two months in a row, right? That's possible, I suppose. But I think what this is saying is that the fruit actually grows 12 different kinds, and every month it, 12, it grows 12 kinds. So even on the months where there's 13, it still grows 12 fruits. <clears throat> There'll be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His servants will serve him. Verse 4, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, or in their foreheads, pardon me. There shall be no night there. They'll need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Who's the they? The servants of God, the people who are with him. Everybody who's been resurrected. And he said to me, these things.